Mark, hello, how are you doing? Hello, I'm doing very well. How are you? Yeah, I'm really good, thank you. It's really good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're, starting each, we're starting each film by asking contributors just to introduce themselves and to um, give us an overview of their work. So would you mind doing that, please? Um, my name is Mark Elliott. I'm an actor. Um, so I pretend to be lots of different people. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, yeah, I've done a little bit of telly here and there. I was in a soap opera called EastEnders for four years, nearly. Um, done some other bits of telly, uh, theatre, musicals. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's a lot. Um, do you mind telling us a bit more about um, uh, some of the work you've done in those various spaces? So you mentioned um, EastEnders, for example. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, could you give us a bit more detail about the kind of work you've done both in TV, theatre and uh, musicals? Yeah, I suppose um, the work in EastEnders was um, pretty full on. That was my first big sort of like telly job. So I was quite, I was a terrified and b i didn't really know a lot about the um the medium really and i i had no idea how fast moving it was going to be and how on it you had to be and how much also how much work has to take place on your own at home after you finish doing a sort of 12 hour filming day because then you have to learn all of your stuff for your 12 hours the following day so yeah it was really full on and a quite quite surprising by how full on it was and also i think deceptively difficult to make it look half decent <laughs> which I know sounds weird considering having done live stuff in the past um, that's something you have to do every night but um, and I suppose lots of people would think you'd have lots of take to, takes doing um, television but no you don't have that many <laughs> um, I think as long as you've got the words in the right order and you've stood in the right place they're quite happy to move on quite a lot of the time in in something that's a big machine like EastEnders yeah yeah so um it's very different and also you obviously uh, dispense with rehearsal time uh, so that sort of goes out the window I think you sort of do one read through rehearsal on your feet of a scene in EastEnders and then, you, then you're being filmed by four different cameras mm. um, who've got you from all angles and got the person you're opposite from all angles as well so that they can literally bish bash bosh do it one shot done ne on to the next one yeah. so um, yeah I found it all quite weird that we didn't get rehearsals per se um, so that was quite uh, exposing and frightening too um, because I love a, a six week rehearsal period. Uh, <laughs> now I'm very grateful for them. <laughs> I want to I want to hear um, from you in this interview. So I'm going to try not to jump in too much. But um, one of the things that excites me about what you've just said is it, it sounds quite a lot like theatre from Shakespeare's time, theatre historically, where there was no rehearsal process really either. And yeah, would... you were just giving your lines, nobody else's, right? Exactly. And then you'd meet up as a group and you'd say, we'll do fight number four in this scene and we'll do seduction scene number eight in that scene but apart from that uh it was quite a bit like you're describing of bish bash bosh get it done well i never knew i never knew anybody else's storylines on the show oh. like, and nobody else knew mine i mean before un unless you watched them mm. right? and then i'd be like oh jesus that's what's happening to stacy no idea because you just don't read anyone else's bits because you've got no time you oh. just have to sort of like fill it the script so literally you take your bits out you work on your bits you do your bits independently. So yeah, it's very similar to Shakespearean time because you literally work on your scenes, your bits, and it's not until you get in front of the other actor that you actually say them out loud for the first time and then you're being filmed. So yeah, no baying audience, but there, <laughs> there is, um, yeah, there's cameras on you, which is maybe more frightening. I don't know, I've never, I wasn't alive in the Elizabethan period and never had anyone throw rotten tomatoes at me, so. Actually, I've still yet to have an item of fruit thrown at me whilst I've been on stage. So this is, I'm doing something potentially right. I don't know. Yeah. Also, you're inspiring anyone watching this, you know, should you wish to change that later in your career. Uh, anyone watching this uh, now knows that you've not had this experience yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm basically inviting people to come to watch me in a show and throw shit at me. <laughs> so given, given the context you just described, when you're pretending to be lots of different people, as you, as you put it earlier, or at least in EastEnders pretending presumably just to be 
one particular person. That yeah, means which was you're, you're also at the same time responding to another person pretending to be a different person opposite you. So there's a kind of live interaction with what yeah. they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, and I I sort of find that increasingly weird, I have to say. I think it's maybe because I feel like more of a grown-up than I've ever felt in my life before, which is, yeah, obvious because I'm older than I was before. But I suppose now, having hit 40, um, well, people can tell anyway, look, it'll be a bit <laughs> um, Yeah, and now having hit 40, I think the... Um, sometimes you catch yourself doing something like I'll catch myself on stage and go this is really weird you know you're dressed in essentially somebody else's clothes mm. um doing a funny accent um delivering lines nightly which makes it kind of even weirder yeah it, it's I found it increasingly weird <laughs> I have to say that I'm a grown-up dressing up in clothes it's make-believe isn't it which is something that we all used to do when we were you know aged four to 14 and i'm still doing it i'm being paid to do it which is which wonderful is <laughs> yeah it is <laughs> so i don't you... know if i answered your question because i don't i've forgotten what it was oh about being opposite somebody and both pretending to be somebody you're not yeah yes there are moments when I think both parties have that realization at the same time, <laughs> and there's that weird sort of falling out of character into a weird. I suppose it's that the, and a good example of that is corpsing, when um, you essentially both fall out and and fall about in hysterics, mm. which is so delicious and feels so amazing, but also absolutely. The most frightening thing that's ever happened <laughs> to me on stage that inability to control laughter is terrifying terrifying have you you've experienced that then oh yeah yeah the best example was in a um show i was doing what's the name of that show it was a, a show called chaos and i was playing a young muslim boy I think I was 18 or 19 or something and I decided to go and fight in Afghanistan so it was a really serious scene laced inter interlaced with bits of black humor but um the actress I was working with Jamila Massey absolutely gorgeous had thought that we'd got to the end of the scene so she was in the wings getting out of one set pair of trousers into another um but she'd forgotten that she had to come on eating a plate of samosas and interject <laughs> during this particular scene. Anyway, it's not going to be funny when I explain it and <laughs> nobody's going to get the reference at all. But needless to say, all three actors on the stage, when we were having this quite weighty discussion about the war in, war in Afghanistan, um, fell about in absolute hysterics because Jamila was hopping on stage with one leg on in her trousers and one leg out. And uh, yeah, I've never... I've never cried and laughed so hard at the same time and I didn't think I'd be able to get to the end of the act and we we managed to but I think I left before the other two actors so I left them floundering hmm. which I was quite happy to do to be fair cutthroat <laughs> leave them to it <laughs> did the samosas make it on stage as well or did they say samosas made it on stage in fact the samosas were a cover for Jamila's own hysteria because she kept shoving them in every time she felt obliged to laugh so um Jamila covered her, her own back really well, I think. <laughs> Advice for us all if we ever get hit with hysteria is to reach for the nearest samosa. Reach for the nearest samosa. That's my advice <laughs> to anyone. Um, so um, East, EastEnders, and we can come back to that, but just to kind of get an overview um, still of, of the kind of work you're talking about, um, could you tell us a bit more either about TV or theatre or musical? Um, kind of, I know actors don't really have a profile in the, um, the kinds of work you do can be very disparate and not connected but just to give us some sense of the kinds of things you've, you've done yeah I suppose um then the other difference being uh, well I've talked a little bit about live theatre but I suppose live musical theatre is another level um I'm probably will end up using the word terror quite a lot during this interview uh, just because I think well, I think we must enjoy it to some degree. There must be sort of an element of sadomasochism involved because we carry on doing it. So we must enjoy it on some level. But I think 
singing is the most exposing thing mm -hmm. ever. And I never foresaw myself going into um, musical theatre. A, because I didn't think my voice was good enough and B, because I just hadn't ever considered it. And C, also, I'm in no way a triple threat because these feats don't work. And <laughs> um, yeah, there's, there's no, I mean, acting just about scrapey, singing scrapey, but dancing, absolutely no chance. So I just never thought that musicals would be an option for me. And then I think in 2000, and, I want to say 12, but maybe I did my first musical. I mean, I'd done stuff as a kid. Um, I, didn't, I did a, uh, a production of Sound of Music in Redditch where I was the only Brown Von Trapp. Um, <laughs> like, so not Aryan race. Um, <laughs> but apart from that, I'd never done musicals before. So my first musical was You're in Town with Jamie Lloyd. And actually, that is oh. a poster You're in Town behind me there. Great. So You're in Town um, was the first musical I'd done. And yeah, I, I didn't really have a lot of solo stuff in that, but it was absolutely terrifying, so exposing. And I gained a new respect for people who work within that field because, yeah, it's very daunting and really scary. I suppose that's, if that's what you've been trained to do, you, you want to do that. But um, yeah, I found musical theatre even more terrifying. Again. Don't know if I answered your question, but um, yeah, live theatre is always really exciting. But I suppose live theatre, with the possibility that might you might not get your note out, is very interesting, indeed. And that's happened to me on a few occasions as well. In fact, uh, the job that I was doing before the coronavirus outbreak, City of Angels, which actually uh, it transferred to the West End, but five years later. It was one of those weird ones that there was a huge hiatus before it transferred. Mm -hmm. And um, we did it back at the Donmar uh, in, well, five years ago, 2015, when we finished doing it. And during that show, I actually earned the nickname of Pure Tone because um, <laughs> there were several occasions where I didn't quite reach my final note. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was affectionately known by the cast as Pure Tone and they eagerly anticipated the um, emergence of that note nightly. Yeah, very kind cast. <laughs> <laughs> really well, I, feel so, I feel so far in giving us an overview of your, of your work, you have very generously and modestly dwelt on all the ways in which you feel like you haven't quite matched up to the job, which is, and I, I think we should make sure we, we clarify that you are a highly successful, very wonderful actor. Um, well, I'm working. <laughs> I don't know, because I, I, and this is an honest opinion, I think so much of it is serendipitous and it's about your face fitting, you being in the right place at the right time, you meeting the right person, um, you clicking with somebody in a room during an audition. And I, I'm, I'm not naive enough to think that you have to be the most talented person in the world in order to, to work. But I mean, you know, I've been doing it for 20 years and for the last 11, I've got to touch wood now, um, I haven't had to um, do anything else. So I'm very, I'm, I'm lucky, so I count myself incredibly lucky, but I also recognise that I must be doing something potentially right because mm. I haven't had to go back to bar work yet. Mm. Watch this space. I mean, when the whole industry, when the arse falls out of the entire industry <laughs> because it's unsustainable due to the fact that we can't go back to it for the next six months, then you'll see me in a bar near you at some point, <laughs> pouring pints. That's a cool combination of... Um depressing and exciting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't quite, know, don't quite know which way to go with that. But I mean, you're talking quite a bit about um, performing as a kind of experiment with failure and a kind of jazzy uh, improv yeah. response to the possibility of failure, whether that be TV and thinking, gosh, can I learn my lines for the next day? And then will I be able to action them and work with someone else? Or will I hit my notes? Or will I have yeah. um, hysterics in the absence of samosas? Um, yes. <laughs> uh, what's emerging from those various accounts and anecdotes is performance as a kind of experiment with the possibility of, perhaps failure is the wrong word, but of, of mishap. Yeah, well I think when anything's live, that's, that's the case. And I think that's why theatre is exciting, because it is different every night, because it can't be the same 
because the environment is always changing. Mm -hmm. And I, when I say environment, I mean every single bit mm -hmm. of that environment, the audience and the cast, you know, I could have a cold that I didn't have the day before, which affects my ability to pronounce a certain word. I, there's a completely new audience in front of us who are gonna take it in a different way to the audience the night before. So I suppose that's the exciting thing about it is that there's a possibility for not necessarily, uh, yeah, you're quite right, not necessarily failure, but all, the idea that it's unknown, anything can happen. <laughs> And that has to be covered in that old saying, you know, the show must go on. It has to be covered. And I suppose the way I talk about it, I don't mean to sound detrimental to myself or to, or to the art itself, but um, I think even from a very, very early age, well, certainly when I was a student at university, I, did, I studied English and drama at um, Queen Mary's in Mile End. Mm. Um, and there was a teacher there, now forgive me, I'm going to forget her surname now, Susie, Susie, Susie. I want to say Susie Dent, but I know that she's in Dictionary Corner on Countdown, so oh. it certainly wasn't her. But um, yeah, Susie uh, once wrote up in my, in my first ever report, um, we were asked to dance colours and to pretend to be penguins and all this sort of stuff. And I just wasn't down with it because I've, I've always been the sort of person who put a script in front of me and I'll attack the character. I think I come at things from a more theoretical point of view, not theoretical, what am I, literate point of view, okay. there's the word, literate. Um, because I think I was always a bit more into my English than my drama anyway, so hmm. I'd attack it in an, an analytical way, yeah. shall we say. So um, dancing colours, particularly when you're colourblind, is quite difficult and I never really got down with it. So in my first um, the words when somebody assesses you assessment my first <laughs> assessment um susie wrote the words mark maintains a shield of irony so it is very difficult to judge him um and i think she sort of hit the nail on the head because i do maintain a shield of irony to a certain mm. degree because i i think it's a defense mechanism where you just go oh right well if I maintain this, then you can't penetrate me and I'm not really engaging, I'm not really involving myself because, you know, I should have just embraced it and danced purple for God's sake, shouldn't I? I should have danced purple. And I don't know whether I would have done it differently now, but um, maybe I would have been more embracing of dancing purple and green then, even though I can't see greens or browns. I don't know, I've just gone on a huge tangent there. I'm not sure ever, which any of it is um, particularly inspiring. It's great, yeah. and that's wonderful. And um, what's interesting is that although you've been talking about theatre as a live art, actually your account of EastEnders as well is, has emphasised that that's live, um, in that there's not much in, in the way of rehearsal. They would prefer you not to do more multiple takes. And so mm -hmm. even where you have um, things which you're recording, a bit like this conversation, um, there's still issues of liveness, even when you have that there as well. Um, I'm, yeah. not saying, I'm not saying that a live problem would end up in the in the TV show, but but still, you're you're encountering that live um, meeting with um, the potential for something strange to happen or unexpected to happen, I suppose. Yeah, and then you're into a whole new realm when um, you discuss television shows mm. doing live episodes. Mm. And I did two live episodes of EastEnders as oh, well. Oh, wow. I was a bit was drunk that? for the first one. <laughs> Were you? I, when I say a bit drunk, I'd had a glass of rosé. Okay. Um, but I didn't have any lines. So I was like, oh. you know, I could be irresponsible. That's probably, you know, that, that's probably one of those things I shouldn't have said because <laughs> 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 BBC now going like, oh my God, what are the legal, legal implications of that? Um, no, yeah, uh, I didn't have any lines in the live app, so I was thrilled. Whereas I think a lot of the cast were like, yeah, bring it on, I want lines. I want to have a storyline during the live episode. I was like, I'm quite happy to just disappear into the background. I think I did a bit of dancing in the Queen Vic at one point. So, um, yeah, I was thrilled with that. That was it. It's, it's strange, because you were saying earlier about how you like text and you like you feel very literate in your approach and you don't like dancing and now you're celebrating the fact that you didn't have any lines and you were dancing <laughs> so I guess we're finding, we're finding out what rosé does to your performance practice <laughs> <laughs> I hate dancing I hate dancing <laughs> I'm, I'm just a huge contradiction 
That's it. Me dancing colours. I was saying I was embracing that as well at some point. I mean, <laughs> nothing um, I'm saying can be trusted. That's what you're gleaning from this. I can't be trusted. Well, I, we're, we're embracing the contradictions. We're trusting them in all the different directions they're taking us. Yes. <laughs> Multi multiply trustworthy. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really interested in the idea that you're walking through particular um, shows, not knowing what other characters are doing as well, because again, that feels like a really, that feels very close to how theatre worked historically. Um, mm. And about, about 15 years ago, there was an experiment in Toronto in a theatre where they took a play from Shakespeare's time, which sort of has a comic plot and a tragic plot, and the characters never really meet each other until the last scene. And they did it in the, in the part system you referred to, where they didn't know what, what the other characters were doing. And the, the actors in the comic part of the play, this is a play called Changeling, they had absolutely no idea that the rest of the play was a tragedy until they ended up on stage in the last scene and they were just dead bodies and gore everywhere. And they were like, oh wow. my goodness, what have we been in? And um, it sounds a bit like the experience of EastEnders is a bit like that, of kind of moving between all these storylines which you don't have time to keep up with. Yeah, and I suppose you have, in, in a situation like that, I'm not saying particularly EastEnders, but in a situation like the Changeling, I suppose you have to put your trust in the director that tonally he'll see or he or she will see to the to the fact that there's a continuity to the piece because yeah i think if if left to our own devices things would be a bit uneven which is mm. it's good it's, you always have to have a linchpin i suppose somebody who's who's overseeing although do you i don't know yeah. is it aristotle is it aristotle who was like he needs to have complete control. Was it him? Maybe. I can't remember. I don't know. See, this is, this is um, how much I was listening during my seminars in <laughs> Yeah. I'm sure it was. Marcus, if it's all right, you've mentioned um, the religious identity of some of your characters so far. And I love the story about the, um, the non-white von Trapp in Midlands, uh, <laughs> England. Um, and I wonder if, is it all right to talk a little bit about how, um, how race, and, race and religion come together in the stories that you're asked to take part in? Is that a big factor in the kind of- Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, th I'm obsessed by identity, particularly right now. It seems like such an important issue now, I think, you know, with the emergence of the BAME movement and um, people wanting to feel and be seen mm. both on television, on stage, so that there's a reflection of uh, a proper reflection of the society that is watching. Mm. And I think um, I'm, I don't know whether I've got anything particularly enlightening to say about it, but I think it's forced me to look at myself in a really bizarre way that I never had really before. Um, and I think uh, I just moved agents and I had to talk to that agent about what, what sort of work I saw myself doing and, it, and the subject of identity came up again because I suppose with an agent, the agent is always thinking, how can I market you? Mm. And with casting directors, it's how do I see you? Mm. Um, so it's, I, I suppose I'd never really internalized that and thought about how I see myself because I don't know whether we do all the time. And I'm not even a hundred percent sure that aged 10, 11, 12, I was aware of my color or, um, and I think I've become so much more aware of that when I started playing, um, characters who were, are of color mm. and, um, so yeah, I was forced to confront my identity in a very strange way as a result of my craft, mm -hmm. which is bizarre. Because I was sort of told what I was, and then I was told what I could be and what I couldn't be as well. We are, we're moving towards the end of the conversation, Mark. Um, and yeah. I, I liked it when you said, just because it kind of fascinates me is how people have relationships with text, uh, which are either good or bad. But you said, you know, your approach to drama theatre ten, tends towards the literate and the text-based. Um, so that leads nicely onto our signature final question, uh, okay. which, is about, which is about literature really, and about what, what that word means. And I guess if I can translate that question into the word that you used earlier, what does it mean to have a literate approach to performance? Could you tell us a bit more about, about that? 
Well, I suppose it's the the uh, the word I used earlier, which is uh, it's about analysis, and mm. I think I always look at a text and try to find patterns within it and meaning within it, um, and that's ever since really I became very interested in English, and um, I did English for GC I did English lit for GCSE for A level, and then I went on to study English and drama at university. So my head was always quite turned by literature and I suppose literature for me in the literal sense is books and um, I'm one of those people who I don't think I'll ever bow to the Kindle I'm afraid I like turning a page um, but I also like writing letters as opposed to sending off an email so um, yeah I think it's about it's to, to succinctly say it, I think it's just about words, isn't it? <laughs> it's about words. And I think performatively, um, you learn words and you deliver words. And it's finding those patterns and meanings within what you're saying and what you've read. And yeah. interpreting the part based on what is written by the writer. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could go all, you know, very... Um, deep with you about Roland Barthes and death of the author and all of that but actually um, fundamentally you look at what's on the page what you know that old exercise of what's said about you what do you say about yourself um, those sort of things I find that that fascinating and that for me is the key into finding out who that person is that you're trying to to play yeah how, how does that process and the search for patterns and meaning in text how does that match a TV schedule where you get the text the day before? Oh, that's out the window there. <laughs> <laughs> You're just hanging on to the words for your dear life. I mean, I got so good at um, learn, erase, discard. Yeah. Learn, erase, discard. Because there's not much time for a lot, of, a, a lot else. And it's certainly not a great deal of time for analysis. And I'm not dissing the genre at all. I'm not dissing the medium of soap because you work blubbing hard um, in, in television and um, I would never diss it. And I loved it. I, I learned so much, but um, I don't think you can apply the same methodology because you don't have the luxury of time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you have that luxury of time going into the, the show? Do you have kind of preparation time where you have character notes or you have long, longer term access to scripts? Or, or is it like that from the start? Um, no, there are, like, uh, I, I think it's dependent upon whether they're on top of scripts, if scripts are coming in in time. Sometimes you have up to, I think there were occasions where I'd have a week with mm. four scripts. So you can, you can bed, bed that in and bed the words in. But of it, sometimes you haven't got time to look at the four scripts that have just arrived because you're working on another eight from prior to that so because you can, can have as many as 12 in your head at any given time oh. and if you've got a busy <laughs> storyline yeah, then yeah, you've yeah. got loads going on so there's lots to keep in your head at any given time I, but yeah I, you were occasionally you did occasionally have the opportunity to look at everything and yeah really well uh, try and uh, forge something intelligent yeah, thank you. I just I just wondered if there was a phase right at the start of the job, you know, through audition and through planning and discussion right at the very start, if there's a kind of period in which you can have some of that, some of that yeah. long reflection process, process and that just keeps you going, that preparation. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, when I did, I, I played a character in Holby, Holby City. I played um, a deranged doctor, um, a horrible sociopath who became a psychopath. But when I went for the audition for that, uh, they said, very early on, you're going to be charm personified, but as the story progresses, you're going to be a horrific, abusive sociopath mm. and a horrible, horrible man. Um, so for that one, for example, because I knew that before I started filming, before I even got the job, I knew that, um, I read a book, I've forgotten about who it's by now, and it's terrible, Confessions of a Sociopath. So I was able to do research sort of before I even started. Yeah. And, that was really important for me because I didn't know a great deal about sociopaths and about um, <laughs> how their brains operate. So for me, having that extra time before I even started filming was really important. So the scripts were 
uh, of course what I was saying was important, but who I was before I got the scripts informed a lot of what I did. Mm. So, um, yeah. yeah, that was, uh, that was one of those points, one of those cases where I was able to do a bit of research on character before I even got one. Yeah. Wow. Great. That's an amazing place to end it. I love the idea of researching a character before you have one. <laughs> <laughs> I should try that with my own personality sometime. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> oh, Mark, it's been a real joy. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure and you've filled an hour of my afternoon. So now I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to wake the cat up. Oh yes, we never got to see the cats. Well, that's because the kitty is still asleep, so okay. all is good. All no right. ankles being chewed. <laughs> Great. Well, good luck waking the cat up, and see you soon. Thank you. Take care. Lovely to see you.